Ok, buongiorno a tutti, benvenuti in IFAM. Adesso è il mio italiano finito. Ok. <laughs> no. Ok, as Asunta said, I'm American. My accent might not be what you are used to hearing. I will try to speak slowly, but I want this to be an interactive seminar. So if you do not understand me, raise your hand, stop me, because otherwise it wasn't worth you coming out here today. Okay, so today I'd like to talk to you about, about breast cancer metabolism and, and, and the work that we're trying to pursue, but I'm going to begin by giving you a little bit of an overview of the field. And I've, I've entitled the seminar Feeding the Beast because I, I would refer to cancer as the beast. So today I divided the seminar into three different parts. I will start by discussing the longevity revolution. We will then move on to um, going a little bit into a little bit more detail about what we currently understand about metabolism in the context of um, cancer. And then we'll move on and we'll finish with a little bit of um, a focus on the work that I am specifically interested in pursuing. So as I said, I would like you to be active participants. There's nothing more boring than sitting through a seminar where nobody raises a hand or nobody shouts out, stop me, ask questions. I'm going to ask you questions. Let's see if, if you guys can participate. So let's begin. The longevity revolution. Now what do I mean when I say longevity revolution? I'm not referring to a bunch of grandmothers taking up arms. What I'm referring to is that although there have been many revolutions over the last century, there's no revolution that has quite such an impact as that of the increase in overall lifespan of human beings. So if you think about it, we're living, and generally speaking, about 40 years longer than our great-grandparents did 100 years ago. Now this, of course, has a significant impacts. And one of the most significant impacts that this increase in, in lifespan has is actually on, on the um, predominance of age-related diseases or the emergence of age-related diseases. So what are age-related diseases? They, they, they are what the title says. They're diseases which tend to, um, to come out much later in life, and there's a large number of different age-related diseases which cover anything from diabetes to cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, and today we'll be speaking about cancer. So, you guys are youngish, and so I wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction to what is cancer in terms of how, how, do we, how do we start to study cancer? What do we know about it? What we know is that most cancers develop due to somatic mutations. So do you know what somatic mutations are? Any ideas? You guys know what mutations are? Okay, so somatic mutation is a mutation which you are not born with. It's a mutation which arises during your lifetime. And these mutations, these alterations in your, in your DNA can occur through many different ways. There are both lifestyle risks, which we all know something about. So sun, UV contributes to melanoma. Um, being a bit of a sloth, like Homer Simpson is here, can also contribute to the development of, of cancer. We all know that smoking has a huge impact on the development of lung cancer. And when I was young, they told me that red M&Ms also could give you cancer. And in fact, there were no red M&Ms in, in the packages. And this is due because this was a chemical carcinogen. So there are many lifestyle risk factors that could contribute to the, to the acquisition of somatic mutations. But unfortunately, there's also some, some genetic risk factors which we can do nothing about. And so one of the, so I, I'm sure that many of you might have heard that Angelina Jolie is a carrier of mutations in BRCA1, BRCA2 genes. BRCA genes are breast cancer genes. And what we know is that a large number of women who are born, this is the case in which you're born with a mutation in one of these genes, have a very, very high risk of developing breast and ovarian cancer in time. So all of these different mutations, what do they do? Of course, they impinge upon your DNA. They change the overall sequence of your DNA. 
Now, we all have mutations, and it doesn't mean that we're all about to get cancer. Mutations have to hit very specific genes to, in order us, to enable us to be able to develop cancer. So which are these genes? So there's two classes of genes which these mutations must hit in, to, to, um, to enable the development of cancer. So these are generally referred to as tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes. So if we want to think about what is the situation for what I hope is most of us, we have a situation in which oncogenes are turned off and tumor suppressor genes are turned on. Now this is important because tumor suppressor genes inhibit proliferative growth. They don't let your cells just start dividing just because they feel like it. Whereas oncogenes do the contrary. They push proliferation in your cells. And so when you have both of these being regulated correctly, Generally speaking, we have no development of cancer. So as you can see, there's only two classes of genes which really need to be hit for us to develop cancer. Now, what happens is if you turn off just one of these genes, the, the, tumor, the tumor suppressor gene. Now, if you turn this off, now we're in a bit of an idling state. So you've lost the gene which is going to inhibit the proliferation, but the oncogenes are not yet activated. So this is like a little bit of a danger category, but it means that we still probably have not yet developed the cancer. What we generally need, generally speaking, is we need to have mutations occurring and in both subsets of genes, both oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, for us to develop cancer. So this is one reason why cancer is referred to as an age-related disease, because the accumulation of mutations over time is something which accompanies aging, and you need a, mutations in several different genes, generally speaking, to develop cancer. So just to highlight some of the more famous oncogenes, because they'll be showing up later in the talk, in, the term, in terms of breast cancer, HER2 or er b due um, is a very famous oncogene, if you want to call it famous, infamous maybe. It's found in about 30% of breast cancers. MYC is another oncogene which is um, very highly studied, which is found in a large number of cancers across all different tissue types, as well as KRAS and EGFR, which are found in the lung. So now I've told you that your lifestyle can influence the acquisition of mutations. That these mutations, we all have them, we don't need to be scared of them, but if they occur in the wrong places, they could lead to the formation of a tumor. But what does a tumor look like? Now, I study breast, and so I'm going to give you a little idea about the kind of morph morphology of the mammary gland. So, we all have, even the men in the audience, um, some rudimentary form of mammary gland. And I want the men to realize that men do get breast cancer. So, we all have some sort of mammary gland. And what is the mammary gland? It basically consists of a tree-like structure. So there are these long ducts which finish in these alveolar structures here. Now these are comprised of many different cell types, but if we have a closer look up at the structure, what we see is that um, the, the breast type specific cells are generally two. There, there's the inner luminal layer, and this, this is the type of cell which is the cell which is responsible for producing milk during lactation. And there's an outer layer which are referred to myoepithelial cells. And these myoepithelial cells are contractile cells, so they push the milk out during lactation when you're, when, uh, if you're breastfeeding. Now, when you develop cancers, you can develop cancers in either one of these layers, but what it normally looks like is that you have an abnormal cell, and this cell will start to proliferate. If this cell, if this proliferation is, is restrained to the mammary gland or to the duct, this is generally referred to as ductal carcinoma in situ because it's staying within the gland. It has not yet gone out. And this is something that we can deal with, that these clinicians can deal with quite well. But unfortunately, what happens in a large number of patients is that this ductal carcinoma in situ matures in time. It develops more aggressive phenotypes, and it can actually then start to penetrate this outer layer and escape. And this is referred to as a more invasive cancer. Now, I've, I wanted to talk to you today about metabolism, and I think there's no better way to, to introduce it than saying this, that cancer is not a one-size-fits-all problem. 
okay? I told you to begin with that cancer is largely referred to as an age-related disease. Now, we live on an average of about 70 years, but there are mammals that live very, very long. I don't know if you're aware, but there are whales that live over 200 years. But it's very difficult to find a whale that has died of cancer. So this is a huge animal that's living a very long time, but it's not getting age-related diseases. Elephants also are very, very large mammals that live a very long time, and they generally are found to not suffer from cancer. This, this curious little animal here is a naked mole rat. So these naked mole rats live underground, and they are basically resistant to cancer, and they can live for up to 30 years. Now, an average mouse or rat would only live a couple of years, so this is quite incredible. So age does not always predispose us to cancer, so what else could do it? So now I'm going to move on to talking to you a little bit more about metabolism and the role that metabolism could play in the development of cancer. But before I do that, I want to stop and ask if anybody has any questions. Is everybody following me? You understand the English? OK. <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> okay. I have a daughter who's in um, the Terza Media, and I don't think her friends could sit through a, an hour of me speaking so <laughs> and follow it. So um, if you're understanding it, that's great. Okay, so let's, let's move on. Okay. Are we ready? So as I told you, elephants do not develop cancer. But this causes a problem because we we're talking about mutations and aging. And one of the ways that we believe that you can accumulate mutations is through stem cell divisions. Now, does anybody know what a stem cell is? Yes? Does anybody not know what a stem cell is? <laughs> So a stem cell is a, is a cell which basically enables the continued maintenance of different lineages. All of our tissues have stem cells, and they're the cells which are responsible for renewal of each individual tissue. And without this, we would, you know, we would not be able to persist for as long as we do because we, there's a con constant turnover of cells in our body. So every tissue has stem cells, but what they tend to do is that they undergo these divisions in which you have one division where the cell divides and then goes into quiescence. They stop dividing and this is going to maintain the lineage. And the other cell which has come out of that division because one cell divides into two will start to proliferate. And this will establish again over differentiation the, new the maintenance of the lineage. So it's largely believed that these cells, which divide once and then sit there, are the cells which may be the tumor-initiating cells because they're long-lived, they do go through divisions, they can acquire mutations, and these mutations can accumulate over time. But there's a bit of a problem with this in the case of the elephant, right? Because if you would look at a mouse and look at an elephant, mice are highly tumorigenic. They come down with cancer with great frequency, but elephants do not. Mice are teeny tiny and don't require that many stem cell divisions. But elephants, to make an elephant, you require a lot of divisions to go from, from, from this to this, right? But these elephants are not developing cancer. So there, we now know that there are many reasons for this. One is an amplification in a tumor suppressor gene, P53, which is a guardian of the genome. And then instead of having you know, two copies, as we do, they have up to 50 copies, which means that we need about 50 mutations instead of one or two, in the case of humans, to lose that tumor suppressor gene. But another reason why elephants may not be as predisposed to acquiring cancer is that their metabolic rates are very, very low in comparison to mice. So bigger animals, lower metabolic rates. Unfortunately, this does not apply within one species. So we now know very well that 
there is that there is uh, obesity rivals only smoking as a preventable risk for breast for for cancer de related deaths such that 20% of cancer related deaths can be attributed to obesity but obesity is largely preventable so unfortunately the increase in size does not protect us from getting cancer so how does this increase in size in humans lead to an increased risk of cancer-related death? Now, there are many different, different factors which are affected by obesity. And, and it becomes, it's truly systemic, meaning that an obese person there as cancer is a systemic disease. Although you have it locally, it affects the entire body. Obesity is the same way, it works in the same way. So largely what we know, one of the major factors which is associated with obesity, which influences cancer-related death, is inflammation. So inflammation is, is an activation and expansion of certain cells within the immune system, which are generally really in place to help to protect you. But it could also, the immune system can also turn against you. So in obese individuals, what we see is we have many different factors being affected. So you have an in increased stiffness, actually, in the matrices which surround the tissues. So we all, have a, we all know that our body is made up of cells. But what you may not be as aware of is that there are, there's an extracellular matrix on which these cells sit. And this extracellular matrix is made up of proteins. It can be made up of other um, supporting cell types. And this matrix, the stiffness of this matrix, how, how hard it is, can actually uh, affect cancer development. And obesity results in an increase in the stiffness in this matrix, which has been shown to actually take a, a, a non-neoplastic cell and, and push it towards the development of cancer. A very, very important aspect of obesity is that it increases the myeloid images and lineages, such as neutrophils. And neutrophils have been shown to have a very active role in the progression of cancer. So they go to distant organs. So if a woman has a cancer in the breast, these neutrophils actually go seed themselves in the lung and create what we refer to as a niche a place for these breast cancer cells to go and sit down in the lung and seed a metastasis. Obesity increases the cells which, which are responsible for promoting this. So obesity, in general, is something that we could all avoid, but it has a huge impact on, the, on cancer progression. But now let's talk more specifically about the cancer cell. So how does the cancer cell persist? What does it need in terms of metabolism and for, for its development and maintenance? Now cancer cells are a little bit different than normal cells and, and we'll speak about that in a minute. But generally, we can divide it, this into three different stratums. So the first being that when you have the overexpression of an oncogene, which I referred to earlier, generally this activates a plethora of transcriptional changes. So it increases, it, it activates the expression of many different genes. And some of these genes are related to metabolism. And this can increase the receptors, which allow for uptake of um, amino acids and glucose. It could then result in changes in how the cells actually acquire nutrients, which we'll come to. It can result in increased activity of the pathways which are responsible for providing the cells of nutrients. And all of these things then have a huge impact on the cell itself because the metabolism is directly linked to the epigenetic state of the cell. Do you know what epigenetics is? Epigenetics was my first scientific love. So um, <laughs> epigenetics, we all, you know, we all have similar genomes. Uh, throughout our, my entire body, my genome is identical. But different cells act and behave and have become different tissues because different genes have been allowed to be expressed in those cells. And the expression of these genes, the regulation of expression of these genes is dependent upon 
the epigenetic status of those genes, so the turning off or on by post-translational modification of histones. And metabolism directly influences this. So how does a, how does a cell acquire nutrients? So a cell acquires nutrients in different ways. But a cancer cell does something which normal cells do not do that often. And you may not become aware of it because I was not aware of it until a couple years ago. So one thing a cancer cell does is it becomes opportunistic. It acquires food from its surroundings. So of course it can pick up proteins, it can pick up lipids, it can take in small molecules. But another thing a cancer cell can do is it can actually eat live cells around it. And it eats these live cells and it degrades them and it extracts from these cells their amino acids, their protein, the building blocks that they need. So cancer cells become aggressive. They, they, they need a lot more energy than any other normal cell needs to be able to proliferate. And it will do anything it can to acquire this energy. Now, what is the difference between a healthy and a cancer cell? So a healthy cell, this is where it gets a little complicated. And this is where, when I was a university student, I turned off. So please stay with me. It won't be that bad. But um, a healthy cell basically does not have a very high energetic demand. It requires some ATP for maintenance, and it requires a couple of building blocks, but most of, the, most of the cells in our body are terminally differentiated. They're not actively proliferating. So they do not require that many building blocks. But a cancer cell is a completely different situation. This is a cell which is actively proliferating. And to proliferate, you need a lot of energy because you need energy to to even replicate your genome. You require proteins. You require n nucleic acids to replicate your genome. You require lipids for signaling and for reconstituting membranes following cell division. There's a lot of requirements which are placed upon these cancer cells which make them have altered metabolisms and make them dependent upon their altered metabolisms. And this is a very exciting moment in the field of cancer metabolism because we have now realized just how dependent these cells become. Because if you take away any of these main pathways which help to supply them with their basic building blocks, this cell cannot survive. So from a therapeutic point of view, to find a therapy, this is very exciting. It means that we may have some handle which is not necessarily specific to the oncogene, but is a general feature of the cancer cell. So this is where my research comes into this. And so I'm very interested in understanding what are the metabolic features of therapy-resistant cancer cells. And so before I start talking to you about my research, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the ways that we study cancer. So there are many different models to study cancer. So this is a little cartoon. I'm going to tell you right now, I use mouse models. And this says, and stay away from scientists, they cause cancer. And we do, but it's all in the name of um, something much more, you know, it's all in the name of uh, good faith. So how do we study cancer? There are many ways to study cancer. And obviously, one of potentially the more, most informative ways to study cancer would be to go directly from the initiating the primary tumor itself. And we can do this. We can take biopsies of the primary tumor, and we can subject this to a large range of different types of analyses. And we can look at the, the genetic heterogeneity of the tumor. We can look at the overall metabolism of the tumor. We could look at the proteome of the tumor. Now this is something which is not easy for everybody to do because access to this material is very, very difficult. And generally the material is, is actually much smaller than you would ever imagine. So this is, although a very powerful way to study cancer, it does not allow us necessarily to study mechanisms. To study mechanisms of, of how these cancers develop, we need to develop tools. And we have done this. So we use a combination of tissue culture. So has anybody ever had the opportunity to work in a lab and, and do any tissue, tissue culture work? 
<laughs> a little bit. Okay, so what this means is that, so when I was a high school student, I reached out. And this is something which I think is a really, really, is something that we're very receptive to. So when I was a high school student, I had the opportunity to spend a summer in a research lab because the PI invited me to come. I was a mess. I spilled chemicals all over the floor. But I loved it. And I had my hands for the first time on what I was learning in textbooks. And I would say that if anybody is interested, you should not be hesitant to reach out. If any of these topics are interesting to you, contact us. We could find ways to, to expose you to it. So cell lines are something that we all use. Cell lines are basically cells which are derived from primary tumors and have now been cultured in, on a plastic culture dish in refined media conditions in an incubator. And we have now a large repertoire of cell lines and they're very powerful. Another thing that we can do is we can take the primary tumor and we can actually inject it into mice. And these primary tumors will generally grow inside the mice and they can be propagated. Another very useful tool, and a tool which I use, is the use of genetically engineered mouse models. So genetically engineered mouse models is what the name infers. These are mouse models which have been genetically modified to express oncogenes or turn off tumor suppressors to allow us to study the progression of cancer. Now why do we use mouse models? I know that the use of animals in research can be something which is a little bit controversial, but there's a very important aspect of mouse models from my research, and that is, number one, no cancer would ever develop on a piece of plastic at 20% oxygen in an incubator. A cancer develops in a tissue, in a microenvironment, which is very complex. And a mouse model allows me to start to, achieve, to, to study this within that within that context. Another very important aspect of mouse models is this. A lot of the cell lines which we use in our, in our research are cell lines which are derived from primary tumors which have been established and detected. But we don't know what, were the, what was happening during those very first steps. What happened when that tumor suppressor was turned off and those oncogenes were activated? What were the first initial steps towards the development of a tumor? Mouse models allow us to study these. So what are the mouse models? Which are the ones I use? So I use a mouse model which is inducible. So what this means is that I can have a mouse which is normal. It's sitting in its cage until a predetermined time. So I would pick about eight weeks in the case of the mammary gland because at eight weeks the mammary gland is fully developed. You can feed these mice of a special diet that then would turn on the expression of the oncogenes. Following the turning on of this expression, what happens is that these mice rapidly develop cancer. And Although you may not be aware, mice have 10 mammary glands, not two. So depending upon the potency of these oncogenes, mice can actually develop up to 10 different tumors across their entire body. But the nice thing about this type of system is that I can do something that no clinician can do. I can cure the mice because I've not only induced the cancer, but I can turn it off. So I use a combination of mouse models and organoids so organoids is a new, a relatively new tool that um, allows us to not just study cells on a piece of plastic, but to culture cells in such a way that they reform some of the original characteristics of the tissue from which they are derived. So I use a combination of my mice from which I isolate cells from the mammary gland. I seed these cells into what looks like a gel. And in a period of about three to five days, what these cells do is they start to divide and they actually form balls, which we refer to as asini. What that looks like is this. And so basically, 36 hours after seeding, you start to get some proliferation. You have this small little ball. Within, you know, within two days, this small little ball starts to develop into a lumen-filled, that means a, a liquid-filled center, which 
more or less resembles what the, the initial um, asini, as I showed you earlier in the mammary gland. Now I could use these organoids to actually induce tumorigenesis. So what I can do is because these organoids are derived directly from my mouse models, I can use the same tools as I use in the mice in the organoids to induce tumor or to induce oncogene expression. This top panel here is a panel of organoids. So this what you see here is like this proteiny gel. Whereas here, this lower panel are biopsies from a mouse. So what you see here is the fat which is surrounding the acinus. Although there are some differences, of course, because this is a very simple system, what we see is that they behave very similarly. So when I in induce the expression of the oncogenes, what I see is that the organoids start to proliferate, they fill in, and this recapitulates what we see in the mammary gland of the mice. Now importantly, as I told you, I can cure these mice and I can cure my organoids because I can turn them off and, and I get a complete clearing out of these mammary glands. So now I told you a little bit about the systems which I use. I would now like to tell you about the question I'm asking. Does anybody have any questions? Everything clear? Okay, more or less. <laughs> Okay, so cancer, how does it progress? Now we've spoken a lot about this, so I'm not going to tell you about this first phase here. But what we know is that you, know, you develop your cancer, you present to the doctor with your cancer. The doctor will provide you, depending upon on the characteristics of the tumor, with many different treatment options. And what we all hope is that following the treatment, that the woman or man who presents at the clinic with this cancer is going to be de deemed a survivor. And that they will be a survivor until the end of their days. But unfortunately, what we know is that many, at least 40% of women who are initially cured will eventually reoccur. And in breast cancer, a very scary statistic is that this reoccurrence does not need to be fast. Women reoccur with breast cancer up to 20 years following their initial diagnosis. Now, of course, I don't want to scare you, but this is the reality. And so we need to better understand you know, what are the pathways to reoccurrence. So we know that there's a very fast pathway, and that, that's this. So that, that you have your primary tumor, you have your surgery, your therapy, and you have a very, very quick reoccurrence. And this is generally due to a very malignant cell which escapes the primary therapy and starts to, to proliferate right away. And this is, of course, something that we're all very interested in, but the question which interests me a little bit more, are those, there are those tumors which reoccur after 20 years. And those tumors which are reoccurring after 20 years, we largely believe are reoccurring from a set of cells which survives the primary therapy, but stays silent. They're dormant. And these cells are referred to as minimal residual disease. And what we know is that these cells can persist for many years, and then following some as yet unknown cue, will begin to reproliferate and establish the reoccurrent tumor. But I ask you, how do you find these cells in a human? How can we study this? If you think about it, this is an incredibly difficult type of cell to study. This is not that type of cell that we can put into a tissue culture dish, because if we knew where they were, we would kill them. We would get rid of them. We would surgically remove them. We would hit them with therapy, and there would be no reoccurrent tumor. But these cells are great at hiding. They're quiet, they're dormant, and they're not necessarily at the site of the primary tumor. They could be in the brain, they could be in the lung, they could be in the bones. And so how do we study this population? It's actually very, very difficult. And because of this, what I've done is I've tried now to, to model this population using a combinatorial approach, using the mouse models I told you about and the organoid culture system. So as I told you, I have an inducible model of breast cancer. And this allows me to, to induce the expression of the, of the tumors in these mice. But it also allows me to treat these mice so that they completely regress. So they are completely cured. I've done what no clinician can do, which is fantastic, as I already told you. But 
if this was the case, I would not be standing here speaking to you today. Because these mice, although they completely regress, they do spontaneously reoccur. And what and this t tumor reoccurrence can happen with a very long latency. And so the primary tumor, this is a survival curve, the primary tumor develops very quickly, whereas the reoccurrent tumor can take up to years to develop. Within the lifespan of a mouse, this is a very long time. And we know that this reoccurrence is happening over the acquisition of mutations in this mouse. But again, I'm presented with the problem of how do I find those residual cells. So I decided that those residual cells may be residing also in the organoid culture. But in the organoid culture, unlike in the, in the human or in the mouse, I have everything in a tissue culture plate. I can find them. So using this knowledge, I decided to try to study these different phases of tumor genesis. So I study, I looked at the cells which have never seen an oncogene. I looked at the cells which have an oncogene turned on, and I looked at the cells which survive after I turn the oncogene off. And I asked, what are the differences, if any, between this state, this state, and this state? And what we found, not surprisingly, is that there are huge differences between the never induced and five day on, because here this is a tumor, and here this is a normal differentiated cell. But what was surprising is that there are still differences in terms of which genes are being expressed between this state and this state. And when we went to go look at these differences, what we saw were these differences were almost completely metabolic. There were huge differences in the lipid metabolism. And so we thought, okay, this is very interesting, but we're studying a mouse. What kind of relevance does this have? And so we, we went back to the human, because now we, we came armed with some information. We know that residual cells have differences in metabolism. Can we find this in human beings? So we took tissue samples from women who had had breast cancer and had been treated. And we looked at the cells which were um, residual after their treatment. And what we found is that many of the same types of genes which we saw to be upregulated in the mouse models of, of this residual population were also found in the, in the cells which are left over in human disease. So we now have a marker for resistant disease in humans. So we can say that we have some, we've gleaned some information from this study because although we started off by saying that we, we didn't really know what was happening in this, in this time window here, what we now know is that these cells have alterations in metabolism and that these alterations in metabolism actually can have some global effects upon the cell and how it behaves and the types of mutations it, it, can, um, it can acquire. So now my lab is very interested, of course, in following up on this, and, and we are now aiming at studying the, the interplay between different metabolic pathways in the context of cancer. So I will finish here. If you have any questions, I'd like to thank you for your patience and um, your time. And I finish with this very inspirational quote, which I most recently saw in Barcelona, which I think is a great message for the young people today, is that you don't need to be great to start, but you need to start to become something great. Yeah.